Today I'm going to be giving you some tips on blending colored pencil with powder blender and talking a little bit about some disturbing finds we've, well, found on some of the sanded paper we've previously used. Today is a sad, sad day. The video camera that has served me well since 2015 has met his end. Farewell, old friend. Well, I can't be alone. I'm gonna have to go get a new one. Off to Best Buy we go. Too soon. Is it wrong for me to say it in front of his corpse? It might be. Okay, now that I am two days late on this video, I can get back to recording the thing I was trying to record for you guys when the last video camera met his end. The paper that I'm going to be using in today's project is the Lux Archival from brushandpencil.com and then I'm going to be blending with Powder Blender. Maybe I should make that not upside down. There we go. I'm a pro here and that is not even close to in focus. This is my GoPro I'm recording on here. No one cares, moving on. So the Lux Archival paper is acid free on front and back and that's important. Why do we need acid-free paper? If we use acidic paper, our work will discolor over the years. The paper turns yellow and brittle. You don't even want something touching the back of the art that isn't acid-free. I've seen artwork where the artist, me, by the way, I'm that artist, used regular masking tape to tape the art to a mat. And over the years, the area where the tape was touching turned yellow and brittle. And that yellowing just slowly spread farther and farther into the art as the years went on. So yeah, it just, Touching it affected the paper. There is a simple pen that tests the pH of our paper. You can get it on Amazon or many craft stores, usually in the scrapbooking section. When you apply this to paper that is acid-free, it should turn this purplish color. If it is acidic, it's going to turn a yellow tone. So here I've got a mixed media paper. I've got the Lux Archival in the middle and then the UART 500. I'm gonna test the back of the both of the sanded papers first. So this is the color. We should be getting a purple tone. There's on the mixed media paper if it is acid free. So here is on the Lux Archival. Again, purple, we're good. Now let's test the UART. Yeah, that's yellow. That's not acid free. Now one of you guys contacted UART and they the gist of what they said was, well, the back won't affect the front because the resins and all of these reasons, it will never affect the front of the paper. You're fine. The people who, who are pointing this out don't know what they're talking about. All right, here's the thing. I tested this same pack of paper several years ago and the back was, was showing up acidic. The front was showing just like these other papers. It was showing that it was acid free. It was not affecting the front yet. Just a couple of weeks ago in a live stream, I was doing this this example showing you guys and you know, you gotta make, make the decision on what you're comfortable with in your own work. So I was just showing the sample and I tested this pen and the front and the back like this. Look what happens now on the front only after a few years of being stored. Here are the same papers. We've got the Lux Archival on the front, acid free as we would expect, just like the back. Look at the UART. When I test this now, it's gonna be really dark because that's normal when you first put a layer on the, the front of sanded paper. Watch as it dries, we're gonna get that yellow tone again. That shocked me because this is the same pad of, the, of paper that was testing with this pH pen acid-free just a few years back. And it's been stored in the original packaging it came from. And I don't know, is the back of the paper already affecting and soaking through the front, which was always my concern? Or is it because it's stored and the back of the non-acid side touches the front of the acid-free size side in storage? Is that affecting it? Either way, this is the result that I'm getting. That, see as it dries, how it lightens up. That's not... I'm not comfortable with that. I will not use this in my own work ever again. You guys decide what you're comfortable with. I'm sticking to the Lux Archival. That concerns me a lot. So I'll still use my, my, my UART as scratch paper, but I won't be doing finished art pieces on it myself anymore. So going back to Powder Blender, a very common question is what kind of paper does it work on? 
sanded paper or paper that you gessoed, like I'll airbrush gesso on a hot press watercolor paper. Those are your two options. And the gesso version, while it works, it's kind of a pain in the butt to do. So it is not my preferred method. Sanded paper works so much better. So here, just to show you, there's our mixed media paper that we used. Watch the difference in how it's supposed to work. Cause I'll hear people say, oh no, I used it on fill in the blank, any other kind of paper than what you're supposed to use. It worked fine. What is your definition of it worked? This here on the mixed media paper, that's not working. That is not what powder blender is supposed to do. This here is what you're supposed to see. Watch how smooth that blends out. Same amount of pencil, same amount of the powder blender product. See how it's, it just spreads. You get this really soft look. That's what it's supposed to do. If you're not getting that result, that soft on whatever paper you're attempting, that's not what I would call working as intended. So you really do want to go ideally with a sanded paper. You will, you'll have much better results. The next question is, can you use your wax-based pencils with the powder blender? I use wax-based pencils all the time with it, but I use it in my final layers with the product itself, with powder blender, blending with powder blender. The higher the wax content of the pencil, the more it seems to stick to the paper and it does not want to blend out with a powder blender. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to use your wax-based pencils. I use them for my final layers on areas that I don't want to blend out, where I really want them to stay put. Watch this as we add these different pencils. We've got the Caran d'Ache Luminance, the Derwent Light Bask, and the Faber-Castell Polychromos. Watch the difference in how they blend on sanded paper with the powder blender. Completely different look. With the luminance and then the light fast, you're going to get this very grainy look. It does kind of smudge them out, but not that much. I've heard people say, we'll try to put the powder blender down first and then the pencil on top. None of it's going to give you the same results as the polychromos. So I, if I'm going to be blending, it's not going to be with one of these wax-based pencils. You'd have the same result with the Prismacolor. Anything with a higher wax-based content, look how grainy and gritty that is. And we'll do a couple layers. We'll see how this looks. Here's with the Derwent Light Fast. Now the Derwent Light Fast are labeled as an oil-based pencil, and you can see they do blend more than the Luminance, but still not quite the same or even really all that close to the Polychromos. The Polychromos definitely seem to have the highest oil content. Now all of your colored pencils, they're going to be a combination of of wax and oil and clay and all these other ingredients. It's just a matter of how much of each of these ingredients. So polychromos for the powder blender is going to give you the softest results. So it almost looks like pastels there. As we zoom in, you can really see what I'm talking about with that grainy gritty look that the luminance and then less so the light fast have. Let's do another layer and see if that helps anything or improves it. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. But I'll show you anyway, just so you don't waste the time on your own artwork. And like I said, I use these pencils. I like my wax-based pencils on sanded paper, but I like them for final layers where I'm not trying to blend it out, where I want that sharp, crisp line. So we've got the Derwent Light Fast, and then again with the Polychromos. One of the things that I found to be really interesting with the Lux Archival paper, look at the fall off you're getting with the colored pencil. You can see the powder coming off. I don't get that nearly as much with the Lux Archival, which surprised me. I just kind of expected all of the sanded paper to be about the same there. And it's not. I just don't get the same level of mess on. It's like the pencil, it grips or sticks better to the Lux Archival. I have no idea why that is, but even if you weren't concerned about whether or not the UART is really acid free, if that's going to be an issue long term, the paper itself is much, much cleaner to work on. So there is blending the second layer and you can still see super grainy, super gritty. Your wax-based pencils or even the light pass that are listed as oil-based, they're just not ideal for the, the layers that you're going to be blending. And I typically am really only blending my base layers with the powder blender. So there you go. Now you see firsthand the difference between some of these pencils. Before we get into the artwork, if you are supporters on Patreon, make sure to head over where you've got three hours of footage on this demonstration available for you now. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon, for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer tutorials. I've got over 200 available for you right now as soon as you sign up and a new one every single week. If you wanna head over and check out my video library to see what is available, I will have a link to that in my video description and you get to watch a free two hour demonstration just for checking that out over on my website. So for this one, I started by doing just a really quick base layer of white so that when I blended the other colors, it'll blend really, really, really soft. 
Now I've got this tan color. Notice as I'm working how I hold the pencil to the side. You can be really loose, very fast, very sloppy with your colored pencil technique when working on sanded paper with powder blender. Here I'm using a soft tool blending sponge. These are typically used for pastels. They're wonderful for powder blender. I recommend getting a lot of different shapes. They're just so handy. I'll put a link to that, those products in the video description. I got mine over at Amazon. So now we're blending that out and I'm just softly going over everything. It doesn't take a lot of powder blender. A little bit lasts a really, really long time. So reloading that again and I'm blending that out. Just keeping that nice and soft. Now, if I were to do a darker background, I'm gonna to have to do several more layers to really get that color saturation in there. So one of the products that you're going to want when you're using Powder Blender is a product called Texture Fixative. It's a spray, and you, as you go, you'll hit a point where when you add more layers of pencil and you blend it out without, with your Powder Blender, then you add more layers and you blend it out, you'll hit a point where when you blend it, it'll start knocking some of the pencil off the paper instead of adding and building up that color saturation. Now here, my background's super light, so I only needed a couple of layers. It didn't take me that, I didn't have to spray the background to fix it into place until later on. But when I do a really dark background, in between every maybe two layers, I will spray with the texture fixative, and that's gonna help seal those previous layers down so that when you add more, you're not continuously knocking the pencil off the paper when you add more powder blender. And with that spray, uh, you wanna make sure that the can is shaken up really, really well, I keep it at a distance and I don't want to push the button down. I found I get better results, softer results, if I don't push it too hard. If you push the button too hard or you're too close to the paper, you can get some heavier droplets or if you don't shake the can up very well or if the can starts to getting clogged, you'll start getting these heavier droplets that spit out on your artwork. Now don't worry, when that happens, it doesn't ruin anything. You're just going to blend it out in your next layer. But you can help minimize that by making sure the cap is clean. So I'll pull the cap off the can and soak it in hot water for a little bit. That will clean that out. I also don't push the button down all the way. I push it maybe halfway down when I'm spraying, so I just get this really soft, fine mist. And of course, don't keep the, the can too close to the paper. We're not trying to blast that stuff on there. Adding a second layer here. And look how sloppy I'm holding that pencil off to the side. If you work in colored pencil on like a hot press watercolor paper and you're blending with OMS, you're going to have a grainy, gritty mess if you hold the pencil like that. Here I hold it to the side, get coverage faster. This is just, it makes working in colored pencils a much faster process. This is a 16 by 20 inch. And I typically don't work that large in colored pencil just because it takes too long. But in powder blender, not a problem. And here is my next layer. Now, I've not sprayed my texture fixative yet. My layers are so light and I need the color to stay light. I don't need to spray it. But if I were trying to do like a dark, dark blue, dark anything, I would want to be spraying these layers in between each, each go. Now, the, the texture fixative spray, it is not the same as like a final fixative or even the final fixative that comes with these products. So if you get the whole kit like I did, the... The texture fixative, it smells about as strong as hairspray. So that's when I'm comfortable using indoors. I wouldn't use it in a room with birds or, or a very sensitive animal. But as far as like just me in the room, it's about the same. It's non-toxic and that's going to be more like your hairspray type odor. Whereas the final fixative or any kind of varnish I've ever sprayed, I always use that outdoors because the scent is so, so strong. There's the final fixative isn't that bad, but I still use that one outdoors. The texture fixative though, I use that straight at my easel and it's about what, what I get from spraying hairspray indoors. You do want to move, if you're like me though, I leave my cell phone next to my easel. I'm usually watching YouTube videos or listening to books or something like that. And I have got, I've had to sit there and scrape with my nail the texture fixative off when I got it all over the phone. It came off, but that that is something to be aware of. Maybe move your phone away while you spray. So here, blending out the base layer of the trunk. So most of the areas where I'm really using the powder blender, it's on those base layers. Once I get into the, the more refined detail, I'll switch, I'll start using a lot more of my wax-based pencils. Especially, you'll really see that when we get into the Spanish moss here. So blending with powder blender, just getting that soft, smooth background. The powder blender, using this method to blend, it's very much to me like when I paint, when I'm using acrylics or oils. 
the way that I layer, the way I get this base layer and then come through with details. When I work with colored pencils and I'm working on a hot press watercolor paper, with those, I'm getting the details. I'll get a, a loose base layer, but I start working on the details much earlier on than I do here. So starting to build up the look of that Spanish moss. And I want it more in focus when it's closer to the bird or at the foreground, and then I'll have it fuzzier as we move back. That's one of the things I like so much about working with the powder blender. It's so easy to get those soft edges. One of the things that will make your work look much, much more realistic is if you're paying attention to where should you have a soft edge versus a harsh edge. When I first started painting and drawing, my brain said everything harsh, everything detailed, and that doesn't look realistic. You don't want that. Start paying attention to your reference photos. If you've got a good photo that you're working from, what areas are soft versus what areas are harsh, and then apply that to your artwork. And what I mean by that is you may have an area, let's say along the, the back of the owl, which is actually not the case here, but let's say you had an area that should just fade softly into the background. You don't have that harsh, crisp line. That's what you're looking for in your reference photo. Where do you have a harsh, crisp line versus where is something very soft and fades out? This is going to help you to add a lot more depth and more realism to your work. I'm coming through the negative space and adding a lot of dark areas in between some of those, the Spanish moss lines that I have in there. One of the things that is so wonderful about working on sanded paper is if you mess something up or if you change your mind and want to adjust things, you can do so many layers. You really never hit a point where it won't take more layers, or at least I never have. So you can, if something's too dark, too light, you can go right over it. It's no, it's so easy to do. The pencil just grips really, really well to sanded paper. So I need to make everything around his face a lot darker than what I want that end result to be so that I can add the light feathers on top. And then smudge that out with my powder blender. So again, just getting that weird base layer. It doesn't look good. It doesn't need to look good at this layer. Don't let that scare you. Those initial layers are not, they're, they're not attractive. Darkening some of this up. I've got to make sure that my dark areas are dark enough for the white on top to really stand out. Same thing here. We're going to go really dark. This is such a scary, ugly stage of this. Now, this reference photo came from wildlifereferencephotos.com, so if you wanted to paint this exact guy, you can get that over there. I'll put a link in the video description to their website. They've got tons of great wildlife reference photos. So now, see, here is when I, I switched over and I'm starting to use my wax base pencil. This is the Caran d'Ache Luminance. So I'll switch over to the Polychromos White, which, by the way, notice how well Polychromos White shows up on sanded paper. That's the, suddenly the pencil that we, none of us really like that much, we love on sanded paper. It works so well. But I'll use my wax base, the Polychromos White, or the Pablo, the white uh, Caran d'Ache Pablo there. And that's the pencil I'm using here, that waxier pencil for the feathers that I want to stay really crisp. I don't want them blending out. Where I switch back to my polychromos white, that's because those are areas that I want to soften up. I want to be able to smudge those out a bit more. So that's what, what really determines when do I use my wax base versus when do I use my oil base. It's a matter of what area do I really want to blend out versus, say, more crisp. So here I sprayed that with the texture fixative at that stage, let it dry, and now I'm going right back over that. Now here I'm using the Pablo, so this is going to be a smaller detail anyway because that pencil does get really fine details. And then it's waxier. It's got a higher wax content, so it's going to stick and not really smudge or move around with that, that uh, powder blender. Now, you don't have to combine your wax and your oil-based pencils. You could do all of this with polychromos and it will be fine. I just find it to be helpful to use my higher wax content pencils when I want something not to smudge. But I've done pieces with this where I didn't use the wax-based pencils at all and it will be just fine. So don't feel like if you only have polychromos, you don't need to run out and buy a bunch of wax-based pencils to get good results. 
but you do need the polychromos. And I layer with these so much, and I, and I know I already mentioned that, but watch as I layer this, it is so much how I layer paintings. Colored pencil, it's a little bit more putting the right color in the right place, the right detail in the right place from the beginning, usually. But when I work on sanded paper and I'm blending with powder blender, I am pretty messy the way that I layer this. It is so similar to oils and acrylics and how I approach it. So blocking in those base layers, really messy. Even the face is not done. Everything's just messy at this point. I tried blending this with paint brushes. It didn't work at all. It pretty much just knocked, and I tried with several different types of paint brushes. It really just knocked the pencil off the paper. Now I can come through and start doing details and you'll see me start mixing in more of my wax based pencils again as I get some of these details. Like those spots, I don't want those to blend out. So I'm gonna use a wax based Pablo. Pablo, Pablos, I don't know. I don't use them that often, so I apparently didn't bother learning how to say it. We've got a lot of little texture in here. I don't need to make sure all of these lines are exact to what the reference photo is. I just need to go for close. Now, remember, just because you have color on the paper, it does not mean that area is done. Keep layering until it looks good. And don't be frustrated when you have some really ugly layers. Another tip, if you see how detailed this is, this is one of those things you would look at and go, oh, that's just too much detail. I can't do that. That's going to be too hard. No, it's actually a lot easier to make something very, very detailed look good. It's tedious, it's time consuming, but it is easier to make that look good than something that is very, very smooth or very simple. Because on those simple subjects where let's say you've got really smooth feathers, you if you don't quite get those right, it, it's harder to make that look good. There's, there's not as much busyness to hide mistakes. Here, this is so busy that if my lines aren't exact, if things aren't perfect, it is so busy most people aren't going to notice. So while it does take longer, don't be hesitant to try some of these things like this, that is the feathers, it's just set a busy, busy area, but it, it's easy to make look good because it's so busy. And so I like to break things up into smaller sections. It makes it easier to tackle. If you look at things as a whole, like I've got to do this entire wing all in one go, it's going to be very overwhelming and it's going to be hard for you to focus on those little details. So notice as I work, I pick one little zone and just work on that zone or a row of feathers. And if I miss a feather, not a big deal. I want to go for close, but if it's not exact, exact, not, no biggie. I want to make sure the eyes are in the right place, the beak, the outline, all of that needs to be more exact. But as far as like each line for each feather, close is close enough. The thing that I'm really working on here, it's not about color to make things look realistic. It's about your values. Are your lights light enough? Your darks dark enough? That is what's going to make a difference in your artwork. We have a tendency to get so hung up on, if I just knew what color that artist used, I could make my work look realistic too. No, the color has very little to do with that. I could have painted this all in purples and he would just look like he's under purple lights, but still look realistic. If the values are correct, are your darks dark enough, your lights light enough? It is so important. Although I will give you one tip. Yellow is a color we don't use that often in wildlife or animals in general. So let's say you're painting a yellow lab you're probably not gonna use yellow unless he's under a really strong yellow light. Avoid yellow in most cases. You'll have birds, frogs, there are some fish that have yellow, but the majority of your subjects, when you look at it and you see a tan color, it is not yellow. If you're drawing a portrait and the, the subject has blonde hair, it is not yellow unless it's actually yellow, yellow hair. Yellow is not a color we use that often for fur, feathers, or hair. There are times for it, just not as much as you would think. So avoid it when you can, because you probably don't need it. And 
Look at all these details. When we're zoomed in, it's not that impressive. When you back up and look at it as a whole, that's when it looks good. Using that Karen Dosh Pablo again for these tiny areas. And then coming back in between those with some of the darker colors, the darker browns and tans. Now, sometimes I will choose to go with a polychromos over a luminance or the other way around just based on that's the color I happen to need. So it's not always, I'm not always choosing a polychromos because I want that area to blend well. Sometimes it's just the better color for that show, that area. On to this next section, we'll get that base layer in and blend that out. Looks like I drew it with my feet, that's okay. Keep layering and keep blending until it looks good. So I sprayed that with my texture fixative there to seal that layer down and now I can go back over it with more color. Blend that out. Spray that. Now I am using there, I sprayed way too heavy, wasn't paying attention to what I was doing and I got those big globs of splattery paint. So I used a hairdryer to dry it so that it would dry faster. And then as I blend over it though, it will all blend out. So if that happens to you and you're like, oh my gosh, it kind of bubbled up. I've got all these heavy droplets. It's not a big deal. Just lay over, layer over it. Now we'll come through, start getting these details. Now for areas that you want really, really crisp, as long as you have sprayed the previous layers where you've used Powder Blender down with the texture fixative, I'm using OMS here to clean up the edges of these feathers. Now it is very, very important that you do have the previous layers sprayed with, with the texture fixative, let that dry all the way, then go ahead and put more colored pencil where you want it, and that's where you can use the OMS. If you skip the stage where you've used Powder Blender and you skip spraying it with texture fixative and then try to use OMS on top of that, you will create this weird, nasty paste. It doesn't look good. It starts lifting up color. It's not a good look. But as long as those previous layers, anywhere where you have used powder blender, you have sealed down with that texture fixative, you can go over with the OMS. And that just gives you this really, in this case with the feathers, I wanted that really, really crisp line that I just wasn't getting with the pencils on their own. And it worked great. The Lux Archival handles wet media really well too. So I know of some artists who have airbrushed on it, it worked, used the, uh, what was it, Ink Tense, I believe, and that worked. So it, it does a really good job of handling wet media. Now one thing that you do wanna keep in mind when you're using Powder Blender products, don't roll the paper up. So like sometimes when I ship overseas, I'll roll, remove the paper from, I won't send it with a mat, I'll just roll it because it's too expensive to, to ship. But if you roll it in a tube, that can save you a lot of money and protects the artwork really well. Not with Powder Blender, this needs to stay very flat. You don't want this to roll up. Now if it bends a little bit as you're you know removing it from the drawing board and, and getting it matted, that's not a big deal. But you don't, you wanna keep it as flat as possible because because that could start to chip or flake off if you bend it a lot or roll it up. So keep it very, very flat. Mounting it would be great. Or in my case, I just go ahead and, and put this in a frame, mat it, put it in a frame. That's gonna keep it, keep it from rolling or anything like that. So you're good there. Have you subscribed? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. You may also wanna click on the bell notification icon because YouTube is terrible about notifying people when new videos go up or sign up for my email newsletter. I send out a update once a week with whatever videos went live and the upcoming live streams.